Let's go to prayer. Our Father, as we come before you this morning, we thank you for this opportunity and this privilege. God, we thank you for your grace and mercy. We ask, Lord, for those that are sick in the hospitals, at homes, nursing homes, shut-ins. Lord, we, we pray for each one. We pray for each need. God, there's so much going on around us today and in this day which we're in right now. God, I just ask you that, that you would be near to us. God, help us. Help us to stand faithful and help us to be faithful. God, we pray you bless our service today, Lord. Bless those that are watching by, <clears throat> by way of social media, by Facebook or by YouTube. Uh, bless those that may be even listening by radio. Father, we pray that you would be with us here in the midst of our service. Bless everything that we do. And may it be pleasing to you. And I pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Well, we had a white Christmas, huh? Uh, yeah. But we appreciate all those uh, the other night on Christmas Eve on our service that helped out and, uh, and worked and uh, Jason works so hard he's wore out and others and uh, appreciate uh, so much and I, I enjoyed it we had a good time and uh, a very special time even though it was cold and snowy and the wind was blowing the Lord was there and I felt his presence and the choir in here singing and the way it all went, it was just real good. We've had several comments on it, and uh, and uh, appreciate everybody. Uh, we want to, of course, remember all the things that are coming up. Of course, here it is, the last week of 2020. Aren't you glad this one's going to be over? <laughs> hey, man, we, we could just have a praise service on that, couldn't we? Uh, but then we don't know what's coming next year. But you know what? Whatever comes, I know who's going to be with us. Uh, he's not going to leave us nor forsake us. Uh, he's there with us. And so we're trying to, been praying, Lord, uh, help me come up with some things that we can do to, um, uh, within the midst of all the restrictions that we have and uh and can I can I say that uh, the restrictions aren't bothering me as bad as the thought of somebody in our church getting COVID and dying? Um, that bothers me more than anything. If it were just the restrictions, uh, I wouldn't be paying much attention to them. Uh, but the COVID is is there it's real people are getting sick uh jenny's had family die from it um I've, we've had friends preacher friends die from it uh, preacher friends wives die from it <clears throat> and some people it's just really weird how some don't have hardly anything going on uh, wouldn't even know that they were sick anthony just couldn't smell or taste vicky's good cooking that'd be awful that would be awful. And Norman, he lost sense of smell and taste. You got it back yet? Okay. Um, and then others are, uh, we know some people right now that are on ventilators. And uh, and so I was talking to my brother uh, yesterday, I believe it was, maybe the day before, and um, he had the virus, and he's still not over it. He's had it's been three months now, and um, so um, he uh, he told me he he's got a 300 pound pet pig, and he's got to get rid of it. And I said, I'll help you take her to the slaughterhouse. He said, No, 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 she's a pet. I can't eat a pet. I said, I can. <laughs> you can't do. Uh, so, Skip, we may go get her, take her to the slaughterhouse. I can just picture some nice ribs and stuff like that. But uh, he wanted to, he wanted me to try and give her to somebody that would keep her as a pet. And uh, 
I said, well, I don't know anybody else like you that would keep one as a pet. But he he just tell me he's not over it. And uh, my sister as well up in Sandusky. And so we're trying to think about some ways that we can continue to do ministry within keeping people safe. I would, it would bother me terribly uh, for one of our people to get sick because of something that I encouraged them to do and um, and they get sick or maybe even die from it. Uh, that, I don't think I would get over that. And so that's the dilemma that I'm in as a pastor <clears throat> in trying to continue ministry, but continue it within... Um, I know a church, they're friends of ours. I've been to... Jenny and I have been to this church down in Georgia a number of times. They're doing things as normal. And they're shutting down every other week because somebody in the church has got COVID. In fact, one person in their church died from COVID because of some of their meetings. And, and I just say, I, I don't think I can do that. So you all help me pray that we can come up with some things that, um, that we can do uh, to continue ministry and keep people involved and keep people uh, connected. And we're trying to do that by being on the Facebook on Wednesday evenings and Sunday evenings. Um, but to be honest with you, even though our numbers on Facebook and YouTube are doing real well, the amount of people in our church have gone down watching it. The, that used to watch it. And so I see that we're losing some connections with people. And so we've been trying to call those people. And so a greater majority of the people that are watching our program are from out of our area, uh, from different states even. And, and we've gained a few, several new in fact, and we've had some folks contact us and ask us if, uh, if we're having regular services and that type of thing that they're wanting to come so so please pray about that in the new i believe in the next year we're going to have to come up with some creative things um, to con to do ministry i don't see this ending anytime soon our um, uh, our uh, evidently our president elect said the other day that our darkest days are yet to come um, but I hope our brightest days are yet to come and with God's grace they will be and with God's help they will be and um, and so let's pray about that and let's keep that in in mind as we go into a new year now um, tonight I'm not sure what we're going to do tonight on the broadcast but uh, whether I might be back into Revelation or wait till Wednesday night and do some special things on on coming up under the new year, but I will trust the Lord, mind the Lord in that, and so uh, uh, we just ask God to bless the rest of our service today. Our next hymn is number one hundred one. You may not know the name, but I'm sure that you'll recognize the tune. And for all those at home that sing along with us, you'll recognize the tune once we get started. Gentle Mary laid her child lowly in a manger. There he Gentle Mary laid 
going to have to get to work on your side and he is a lucky woman Tuesday will be 51 years with me. Yeah. Yeah, do we want to have a special prayer now or what? Uh, what? <laughs> hey, thanks a lot, friend. Yeah, but no, I, I put on Facebook the other night that this was our 53rd Christmas together, counting court, and, and um, <clears throat> I remember I went out to their house, her house, for Christmas and uh, Christmas Eve. But um, we we decorated the tree out there and back years ago. You can turn to John chapter four if you like. Years ago, when I was growing up, Mom would. Uh, my oldest brother probably had the job of going up on the hill and cutting a tree down until I come along and was old enough to, um, you know, at least six years old to handle an axe. You know, back then we handled axes and saws at a very young age, uh, knives and all that. But mom would tell me to go back on the hill and get a tree. We had a lot of uh, a lot of pines, but we had a lot of cedar trees there as well. And, um, you know, one year I'd get a pine, and the other year I'd get a cedar tree. And <clears throat> This one year I got a cedar tree, and, um, and it was a horrible-looking tree when I think back on it. But to me, it was the prettiest tree up there, and I cut it down, drug it off the hill, and... Um, mom put it up and it was a beautiful tree you know and we did did any of you all ever do this we popped popcorn and mom had cranberries and we'd string popcorn and put a cranberry every now and then and then string some more popcorn put a cranberry every now and then you all ever do that for garland around the tree some of you are saying no Joe you all done that and but that's we made garland around the tree. Good thing about that was you could eat the popcorn when it was all over with. But, uh, but that's what we made for garland, and and then we make you know when we was kids we'd make those little paper garland and glue the ends together, make the garland. We hang those on the tree as well, and and um, so it it'd be pretty when it was all done. But we we put up a tree. And I remember Jenny said, I believe that's the prettiest tree we've ever had. And so uh, it, so to me, every Christmas since then, we've not always had a tree. In fact, I don't think we put up one last year. But uh, every year has been the best Christmas for me. Um, so um, I'm a lucky fella. I'm, I'm married up. Amen, Skip. We married up, didn't we? You did too. So all of us did, all of us guys. John chapter 4. Another one of my favorite verses in the Bible. Larry, I don't think I've got any sound on mine. I'll stay close. I'll try and stay close. When I back away, I notice that I don't hear me. Um, John chapter 4. Yeah, I've got a green light, but one of my favorite chapters, um, 
because of the story that's here. Uh, we've come through John chapter 3 and, and the need to know Christ and the need to know God. And, um, and I, I've heard over this, even this Christmas season, a lot of mention of God and not much mention of Christ because people are trying to be politically correct. And as I said last week, and I'll say again, and I'll continue to say as long as I have a voice, is you can't believe in God, not believe in Jesus Christ, and still go to heaven. The two go together. You can't believe in one without the other and go to heaven. It, it, it just it doesn't happen. Uh, we take God for granted sometimes. Uh, we take Jesus Christ for granted. We, we take God for granted until we need him. And then when we need him, we, we call on him and search for him and beg for him to help us. In the same way with Jesus Christ, as I was talking about the atheists, I heard a fella the other night uh, giving his testimony. As a, he's a Christian comedian, and he said he was playing golf with a Christian friend, and they were talking, and he asked him, uh, said, you know, are you a Christian? He said, no, I'm an atheist. He said, no, you're not. You're an idiot. And he said, what do you mean by that? And he said, well... Only a fool says in his heart there is no God. I heard B.R. Lakin speak one time. I don't know if you've ever heard of B.R. Lakin. He died several years ago, but he was from Fort Gay, West Virginia, just south of Huntington. And uh, a tremendous preacher, powerful preacher. I spent a lot of time in our area up there, traveled the world preaching, and he was flying on a plane one day, and he sitting down and as the plane was preparing to take off uh, the guy sat down beside of him and getting settled in and they struck up a conversation and he looked at Dr. Lakin and said uh, hi my name is such and such and, and Dr. Lakin said I'm B.R. Lakin and the guy said what do you do for a living you traveling for work and he said yeah I'm going to go preach I'm a I'm a uh, evangelist and gospel preacher and uh, he said uh, where you going and he told him he said are you a Christian he said no no I'm an atheist he said oh Mr. Fool and he stuck out his hand and he said let me shake your hand I've never met a fool before in my life and he and so the guy kind of withdrew from him and he said what do you mean by that and he said only a fool says in his heart there is no God and he said, so I've always wanted to meet one of you. Never had. But the comedian the other night was talking about that and how uh, he didn't believe in God, but he left there. Uh, and the fella gave him a bunch of tapes and, and uh, a Bible to read and tapes to listen to, and he didn't want to listen to them. And he's... And his marriage fell apart. His wife, as she was leaving the house, she got that box of tapes and that Bible, put them in front of him and said, read these or we'll never see each other again. And um, so he said several days went by and he picked up one. And he opened it up in Ecclesiastes. He read Ecclesiastes and listened to the tape and, and he said without God there is no purpose without purpose there is no hope without hope there is always a desire for suicide he said that fit him to the T somebody asked him said well that's strange that you would get saved reading Ecclesiastes that's such a doom and despair book. And he said, you didn't know me. I was a doom and despair person. 
There's people all around us that are doom and despair people. John chapter 4 brings us to one of those places, brings us to one of those people, the Samaritan woman. I've preached these passages of Scripture many times, but not like I'm going to preach them here in the next week or two. I've spoken on this subject a number of times. In fact, if you remember, I brought my water pot one time and preached here, and I talked about her leaving her water pot at the well. Now I have that water pot sitting in our living room and I walked by it this morning and looked at it and remembered that message. If you look with me in verse 1, when therefore the Lord knew how the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself baptized not, but his disciples, if you remember the kind of a a jealousy statement that went on in chapter 3 the disciples came to John and said hey what's this guy Jesus doing you know you're out here baptizing he's over there baptizing and more people are following him and John says I must decrease he must increase it's okay it's alright so Jesus knew of the contention that was going on and so he left the area he got out of there he left Judea and departed unto Galilee. And he must needs go through Samaria. That he must need to go through that particular area of the country. He needed to go through Samaria. Although the road through Samaria was, they say, the shortest route from Jerusalem to Galilee... Uh, most Jews didn't go that way. Most Jews wouldn't travel that. They avoided that road because of the down and outers. They did so because there was a, a, a deep distrust and dislike of the Samaritan people. They avoided these people because of their class. These people were stayed away from. The, they wouldn't have any dealings with them. In fact, when the Babylonians conquered the southern kingdom of Judah, they took almost every population that was there captive. And they exiled them to the Babylonian Empire. But all that they left behind was the lowest classes of people. Guess who they left behind? The Samaritans. Because they were what was called half-breed. They were of mixed race. They were not of white or black, but they were of mixed religion. They were of mixed groups of people. They, uh, the Jews had married pagan women, and they had children and therefore they were considered half-breeds. They were outside of their religious beliefs, and so they were the lowest classes of society. They didn't want these lowly, this kind of people. Uh, they didn't want them regarded as Babylonian people because they were a proud people. They were proud individuals and so they didn't want to take these people that were of low class out of Judah and, and take them to Babylonia of all places and make them a citizen of that place and they these were ones that were left behind uh, intermarried and, and non-Jewish peoples who uh, they, they came into this region and and there was prejudice against those people. And the Samaritans emerged as, a, a, as an ethic and a religious group that not very many people would have anything to do with. 
We just didn't know that kind of person. I, I hate to say this, but I'm over my ministry of, of uh, over 40 years of preaching, I've had a number of people when I've been in churches and, and uh, when I was younger and felt better and I, I, I pray for this church all the time and I'm so appreciative of these people here for putting up with me and my physical needs and all uh, and but when Jenny and I would get out and we invite people that that uh, might not fit the mold in fact let me say that probably most of us here this morning and and all, and mo let me just put it this way all of us here this morning and all of us watching by Facebook or YouTube fit the mold. That all of us were nothing until Jesus Christ saved us. Amen? All of us. Now, we might have been, we might have had money, we might have been uh, born into money or whatever, but all of us were sinners. All of us were dying and going to hell. All of us were uh of a particular ethnic group but I've been told a number of times not here and I'm not picking on you all but I'll pick on some other folks but I've been told a number of times preacher we don't want that kind in our church and my statement always was you were that kind before you got saved you were lost and dying going to hell, but we don't want that kind in our church. We don't want those types of people in our church. And I think about this when I think about uh, what Jesus said, that I must go through Samaria. There's something there that I've got to do. There's something there that I've got to concentrate on because the Samaritans had a history historical connection to the people of God and to the people of Israel their faith was a combination of, of commands and rituals that they adopted from the law of Moses in fact their place of worship made the Jewish uh, the Israelites place of worship look like uh, an outhouse of some sort a smokehouse maybe of some sort but, but that they put uh, together a lot of various superstitions and, 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 and ideas, but most of the Jews in Jesus' time despised the Samaritans. You remember the story of the Good Samaritan. You remember what had taken place there because they were, they, they even disliked them more than they disliked Gentiles. Ooh, of which we are one. But so these these folks, they were half breeds. You know, I, I love a good western. I love a good western. Do you all? My mom loved westerns. Gunsmoke. Uh, when I'd go up to the nursing home and see. Nina and, and others, and especially Nina, I'd go in and gun smoke was on. Preacher, you're going to have to come back. Come back after a while. Gun smoke's on. Uh, and, and this, you know, I mean, you know, you get John Wayne, that walk he's got and all that, you know. Or, or I love the old Audie Murphy. Westerns, you know, that guy was some, you know, he was a hero in the war and all, but I, I just love to watch the old Westerns. I'll, I'll get on uh, on uh, TV and I'll, I'll ask, you know, they've got those things now, those remotes you can just speak into and it'll pull up whatever you want to watch. I, I don't have a big uh, fancy setup and I don't have an expensive setup as far as 
Uh, I've got the smallest package that you can get uh, to be able to watch TV because Jenny doesn't care if there's nothing else except for the Food Network and HGTV. That's awful. I go to bed hungry every night because I've watched two hours of the Food Network. I've got to get up and fix me a sandwich because I'm starving to death. But now, a good Western anytime, throw it in there. But, I, but you see on there every now and then what they call a breed. They were referring to, even on Gunsmoke, remember, uh, what was that, what, that actor's name? Uh, and he was on, on Gunsmoke. He is a blacksmith, and uh, uh, they call him Clint on, on the Gunsmoke. And he was a breed. He was a half-breed. And he was always getting in trouble because he was a breed. Nobody would give him business because he was a breed. Nobody would help him because he was a breed. I want to tell you something. I was raised up a hollow in Fudge Creek. In fact, the name of that hollow is still Hutchinson Hollow because my grandfather owned all of that hollow at one time and started selling it off to some of his sons and then to some other people and it still got the name Hutchison Hollow on it and some people tried to change the name of that hollow because they didn't like the Hutchinsons and there were people in that area of Fudge Creek some people not everybody but some people up there that did not like us did not care much about us because of who we were So I understand these folks of withdrawing themselves and, and trying to accomplish something within themselves separate from others that we still want to worship God and we still want to uh, do for God. We still want to love God, but we're going to have to come up with some things in our own way because the establishment religion won't let us be a part of them. And so I guess... That's why I've always been so independent all of my life because I don't care what the establishment says. I don't care what... When I was ordained into the Baptist church and the, and the moderator uh, through questions that were given to him and as Charlie and I sat there on the stage of the church and, and he read a question, he said, if you ever quit believing like a Baptist, will you be willing to turn in your papers, my ordination papers? I said, yes. And if the Baptists ever quit believing like I do, I'll turn them in. Because I believe the Word of God. And I believe this more than I am a Baptist. I believe this more than I am anything else except a Christian. I believe the Word of God. And that... I don't fit into a mold very easily because I never did fit into that mold. And there, as Jesus Christ is going through Samaria and coming to the well, that Jesus comes to the well of Sychar or Shechem in, in Samaria, uh, and this is Jacob's well that was there. The city of Sychar was an ancient uh, Shechem, if you would, uh, and was the capital city uh, there of the Samaritan people. There is where Abraham or Abram first came when he arrived into Canaan from Babylonia. There is where God first appeared to Abram in Canaan and renewed the promise of giving the land to him and his descendants. There is where Abram built an altar and called upon the name of the Lord there is where Jacob came safely when he returned with his wife and children from sojourning in Laban. There is where Jacob bought a piece of land from a Canaanite named Homer uh, for 100 pieces of silver. There is where Jacob uh, uh, built an altar to the Lord and called it El Elohi, uh, Israel. Uh, this established the connection between Jacob and and what became known as Jacob's Well there at Sychar. 
Sychar, Shechem was also the place where Dinah, the daughter of Jacob, was raped and the sons of Jacob massacred the whole city in retaliation. This is where the plot of ground that Jacob gave uh, his son Joseph, land Jacob had conquered from the Amorites with his sword and bow in an unrecorded battle as far as is there. This is where the bones of Joseph were eventually buried when they were carried up from Egypt. This is where jo Joshua made a covenant with Israel, renewing their commitment to the God of Israel, proclaiming, as for me and my house, we will serve God. Some think that Sychar, which means drunken, was originally a contemptuous name that applied by the Jews to Shechem because of the situations that were going on there. So it's a, a special place. It's a tremendous place with tremendous history. Now it's in a place to where the Jews don't even want to go. They don't even want to pass that way. Last week, Norman asked me, he said, you know why West Virginians don't wear shoes or why they don't wear shoes in West Virginia? I said, no, why? He said, because it's holy ground. Hey, man, brother. Right, Anthony? Uh, come on now. Help me out. Uh, almost heaven, West Virginia. But anywhere God is is holy ground. Anywhere God's people are is holy ground. What a history this had there. But after a long day of walking, no doubt, Jesus is tired it's at noon during the day, probably really hot. Jesus is hot and tired, so he sat by the well. He sat there by the well. This little word, thus, seems to have a force that's difficult to re reproduce in the English language. Um, it, it's used or probably is intended to enhance the idea of, of utter weariness. He's just wore out. Can't go on. Can't go no further. Or that something's stopping me here. I've got to get back over here where I can be heard. Where something stopping me here. If you ever get to a point in your life to where you just couldn't take another step, you're so tired, you just got to sit down. Or something has just stopped you in your tracks. You can't go any further. To me, I think this is what it's saying, that Jesus was stopped in his tracks at the well. Why? Because God knew who was coming to the well. Because Jesus had said prior, I must go through Samaria. He did. Now, I know that Jesus is God in the flesh. But even in the flesh, he knew I don't know, maybe everything. No, I take that back. He didn't know everything. You say, wait a minute, preacher. No, let me bring up one. Remember when the disciples were asking when will the end be? He said, I don't know. Only the Father knows. Remember that one? So he didn't know everything because the Father hadn't revealed everything to him as a person. And so maybe Jesus knew that he had to go to through Samaria 
but he wasn't sure where. Maybe Jesus knew that he had to travel that road, but he didn't know where it was going to end up. Now, I'm, I like this thinking because I, being human, I, I know sometimes God tells me to go certain places or do certain. I, can I give you an example? Uh, I wanted to buy an XM radio. Years ago when they first came out, I wanted an XM radio. You all know what XM radios are, right? Satellite radios. And, you know, I mean, you can go from one end of the world to the next and still listen to the same station. I mean, that's amazing. And I wanted a portable XM radio. I was in my Dodge Dually diesel that I've got now. This is several years ago. Jenny and I was going to Atlanta, Georgia from Gatlinburg, Tennessee. We were going down, I believe it's Route 411. And that's down through the country. Interstate 75 goes south off to the east of us a little ways. But going down 411 is just a pretty drive down through the foothills of the Smokies. And we were going down through there. It was nighttime. And so we were going down through there, and there's a place down there about Sweetwater, Tennessee, I believe it is, that you can turn off and go over and hit 75 just north of Georgia. Now, forget the exit number, but some of you that have been that way, the Flying J truck stop is right there. And so we were going down through there, and I said, baby, and that's what I call her every now and then, when... I'm not mad at her, but no, I call her that all the time. I said, baby, you want to go over to the truck stop on 75? They've got XM radios for sale. And they were about the only place that sold them was at truck stops. I don't know. Do you need fuel? No, no, I don't need any fuel. I can get to, uh, to Georgia or you know, where we're going, I can get down there with what we've got. And so we went all the way, and I said, baby, I think we need to go over to the Flying J truck stop. I'd like to look at the XM radios. Now, when I get done with this story, you'll realize she's a whole lot more spiritual than I am. So we got down there to where the turn on. I said, let's go. She said, okay, let's go. So we go over there, and... And we go in, we park, she goes to the restroom. I'm standing there looking and drooling over these XM radios. And, and they have one on sale. And, and I'm thinking, I'm going to get this. I'm going to get this. And so I get the person to get it out of the case, and I'm standing in line. And Jenny comes out, and she says, oh, you're going to get one. And I say, yeah, I'm going to get one. They got one on sale, so I'm going to buy it. And so a little bit later, I see her and a little black girl talking. And then Jenny comes up to me while I'm in line to buy that XM radio. And she said, come here quick, Joe. She wants to get saved. Come pray with me. I said, you go ahead. I'm buying the XM radio. Now, she's a whole lot more spiritual than I am. And so I stood there and I looked toward them and and I prayed for them. And she went back over and grabbed, what's her name? Angel Fox. Angel Fox. By the hand. And they stood in the gift section of the Flying J truck stop. And she was gloriously saved. Jenny had gone to the restroom. And while they were in the restroom, that little girl was in the restroom with her. And she asked Jenny if she had a cigarette. And Jenny said, no, no. Said, you shouldn't smoke either. And she said, it doesn't matter. I've got cancer and I'm dying. And I'm dying within just a few weeks. And I'm out on the road with my boyfriend traveling one more time. And Jenny began to witness things. 
And when Angel came out of the restroom, she came up to Jenny and said, you know, that was good advice that you gave me. And she wanted to be saved right then, right there. I really thought I was going to Flying J Truck Stop to buy an XM radio. But God had Angel Fox there at the same time ready to receive his son. Well, I could tell you other stories. Story, story after story. That God would tell us to go to a certain place and we'd get there and go to witness and to somebody and they get Can I tell you one more? I, I may have already told you all this a long time ago. But there was a young boy in Bardstown, Kentucky. Jenny and I was coming from Nashville, Tennessee, up through Bardstown, Kentucky. And there at Bardstown, Kentucky, is a little place called the Boone's Tavern. George Washington slept there, by the way. Abraham Lincoln, a whole bunch of others. It's an old, old tavern has a restaurant in it. And I think you can still stay there, or you could at that time. It was pouring rain, and I'm not sure whether it was December, January, sometime, but it was cold and rainy. We were coming up, and I said, Jenny, how about let's stop at Boone's Tavern, get us something to eat, get off the road for a little while. We hadn't been to that place in probably 13 or 14 years. And just felt the urge to stop. Of all the places we could stop, I said, let's stop there. And I don't know, let's see. We come on up the road a little ways. And so we, I said, baby, how about let's stop there? Let's, let's go in. We haven't been there in a long time. Let's go in and, and let's grab us a bite to eat. And so we decided to get off and go in. Hadn't been there a long time. Went in, and there was only maybe one or two other couples sitting, and it was about this size, probably, maybe not quite this big. And there were about five or six waiters and waitresses over in the corner, and they were looking at us after we got seated, and Kyle came over to wait on us. We said, you drew the short straw, did you? Yeah, so Jenny started witnessing to him. I started praying. He took our order, and I'm not sure whether before we got our order or after we got our order, he sat down with us. Jenny led him to the Lord. We prayed, and he was rejoicing, and we were rejoicing, and he said, boy, this is awesome. I said, yeah, it is, isn't it? He said, no, you don't understand. This morning... I got an email from somebody that I don't know that told me that God loved me. And he said, God, if you really love me, send somebody by today to tell me about Jesus. And he said, here you are coming from Nashville, Tennessee, going to West Virginia, you stop here to eat and if out of us five or six people I wait on you and you tell me about Jesus I said that's God you see Jesus said I must go this way There's something that has to be done. Now just for, and it's not plain, it's not, it's not there, so I'm not going to speculate, but I, I think that Jesus knew what was going to happen. Maybe he didn't know where it was going to happen. Maybe he didn't know how it was going to happen. Maybe he knew everything. Maybe he, he already saw it. Because he did see. In the few, he saw Andrew. He saw others. He saw other things that were going on. Long before he met the people, he saw 
things. So I'm not limiting Christ, but just for the story's sake, he had to go that direction for a purpose. And I think in our lives, God has us going a particular place, a particular way for a particular purpose. I never dreamed in my life that Jenny and I would ever end up in Clintwood, Virginia. Because the real estate agent told me when I first came here that people don't move to Clintwood, Virginia. They move out of Clintwood, Virginia. But here we are. You're here. Born here, maybe came here through other means or whatever else. Some of you that are listening on Facebook, you're not here. But wherever you are, God has us going a certain direction to a certain place to do a certain work. There's a need there. And it might be to people that we would not normally deal with. Are you kidding me? Angel Fox was living with a man, traveling with a man on a, on a semi-truck. She was dying with cancer. Uh, I believe it was cervical cancer that she had. And, that, and you telling me that God cares about her? We don't want that kind of person associated with our Christian fellowship. We don't want those kinds of people uh, named among us. Kyle didn't say what was going on in his life, but he did tell us that there were some things going on that he needed Christ. There's a lot of people in our area. I hear it every week. I get messages every week from people. People that maybe others won't have much to do with. But for us, we should. He had to sit at the well. He couldn't go any further. Because there's where it was going to happen. He couldn't leave that place until it happened. Let it happen. In our lives. Let it happen. In our families, let it happen. In our community, let it happen. Go no further. Now think of Moses in the Old Testament in Exodus chapter 33 when God says, My presence will not go before you any longer. I will send an angel, but I'm not going. And Moses, after a little while, says, God, if you don't go with us, don't send us. We'll stand right here. Moses was basically saying, God, I'm staying here until it happens. And it happened. And God said, all right, I'll go with you. Now let's go on. And there were other moments and other places and other times but this spring of Jacob is beyond doubt that known to, to this day by Samaritans, by Jews, by Christians, by Muslims as the spring or well of Jacob. And Jacob would return to that place to rededicate his life to God. And sometimes we need to go to that place where we've been and and I've been preaching in Revelation and uh, in chapter 2 when uh, the church of Ephesus had left their first love. Not lost their first love, but left their first love. And I said during that particular time, I said if you lose something, you don't know where it's at. But if you left something, you know where you left. If you left it in the car, you left it in the home, you left it in the house, 
uh, in the room. If you left it at work, you, you left it, you know where you left it. And you've got to go back to that place where you can't go any further until something happens. I don't know where that place is for you. I know where it's been for me for a lot of times, but I don't know where it's for you. But I would encourage you, God's leading you to go to a certain place. Go there until it happens. Stand with me, please. Norman, would you come? Father, we come before you this morning. I'm thankful for the message that you do take us to the place. You do lead us to a place. God, I... I pray that that place will be evident to us. Maybe we'll have to go. Maybe we just have to go in that direction for a little while. And then you'll stir in our hearts. And we'll be like Jesus that we'll be wearied from the journey. And we cannot go any further until what you plan takes place. Till it happens. This might be the day. In some people's lives, this might be the moment. And I pray that it is. And I pray it in Christ's name. And amen. Number 300. Without him I could do nothing. Without him I chose. Thank everybody. I want to thank folks for Christmas cards and cookies and and cakes and snacks and and all that good stuff. We appreciate it. Um, and and one other thing too, this month is my four year anniversary here at this church. Yeah, seems like six or eight at least, doesn't it? Uh, yeah, but uh, no, I'm it. Time has gone by very quickly, um, and it may have been rough for you all, but it was rough for me, too, physically speaking. Um, I'd rather not have gone through what I've been going through. You all were probably the same way, but God bless all of you. Thank you so much. Uh, 
a happy new year to you if we don't get to see you before then um, but um, Lord willing we'll see you next year how's that God bless all of you God bless you